If we have 24 hours in a day, we ought to spend two and a half hours before the Lord, teaching, preaching, praising, praising praying. We ought to spend some time with the Lord. <clears throat> I'm telling you that we have 168 hours in a week. And we have people crying. We have people crying. Can you reset the fire alarm for me? We have people crying. We have people crying about two hours on Sunday, an hour on Wednesday. And the Lord has given us his very best. What do y'all think about that? What do y'all think about those crying people? What do y'all think? Anybody? Somebody talk to me. Crying, you say. Yeah, whining people. Yeah. Somebody said that's one of my words, so. Whining. Uh, people who just. You remember how they got up that morning? Whining about. I find my, I, when I first got real sick, I found myself being a whiner. And I said, nigga, nigga, God woke me up, nigga. Follow him. So when you think about complaining, think about Abram and Cain. Think about how Cain killed his brother because God did not receive his gift. So what I'm saying to you is when you give, it blesses you as well as the receiver. The giver is, is blessed also. And that's why we have to bring our very best gift before the Lord. So 1 John chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 deals with Cain and Abel. Then he goes on to say that the love of God abides in you and, and, and you are saved and you have this sanctification. And then it talks about Cain was a murderer. And when he talks about Cain being a, being a, mur a murderer, what he says is no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Key word that Brother Whitlock focused on last week, key word was abiding. Abiding. In other words, you ought to have some demonstration. You ought to demonstrate your love. You ought to walk in your love. People ought to see love exuding from you. People ought to see love flowing from you. People ought to love to be around you. Because you are an example of love. You are an example of God's love. So 1 John chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, deals with how we ought to carry ourselves when we love our brother. When he says love your brother, is he talking about the same folk that were born in your house? No. Yes? No. No? How many people don't have a brother, don't have a sister in your house? I have got one? Children, okay, so, so we know he's not talking about that. He's talking about those who are fellow Christians, those who walk in Christ. So when we arrive here at 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, he says, by this talks about love abiding in you and God abiding in, in you. And he leaves no stone and no question about it, no stone unturned, because he says you either abide in God or you abide in the devil. There's no gray area. You have a choice. The choice is yours. You can either abide in God or abide in the devil. Are you with me? There's no in-between. There's no gray area. There's no compromise. You either of the Lord or you are of the devil. And then he says, by this, we know love. As you abide, abide in love, as you, as you reach out in love, he says, by this, we know love. We know what love is all about when you love somebody else. Then he goes on to explain it. He says, because he laid down his life for us, who is he? Jesus. Jesus. 
Jesus laid down his life for us. He voluntarily gave his life. When they came unto Jesus, he says, no man takes my life, but I lay it down for my friends. No man takes my life. I just lay my life down. He's saying this is a volunteer thing. I'm, I'm volunteer. Now, that's another question. What do you volunteer for God every day? Well, God, I said, thank you. Ain't that enough? <laughs> Well, God, I, I woke up this morning and the first thing I said is, Lord, thank you. You don't think that's enough, Lord? I can't spend all day with you, Lord. I got, I got to do something else. But prayer is an attitude. Love is attitude. We're going to find out tonight that it's not just only an attitude. He says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. He laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That ought to mess you up right there. He talks about Jesus. He talks about Jesus laying down his life for us. How did Jesus lay down his life? He laid down his life by giving his life. And then he says... We ought to, like Jesus, lay down our life for the brethren, for our brothers. Is he telling us to lay down our life like Jesus? Well, he says it, right? He says, as Jesus has laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Some of y'all say, I don't even like my brother. <laughs> you think I'm going to give my life for him or for her? So we know he, he's not saying that we ought to die and lay down our lives for him, right? But he says, as Jesus. He's going to go on in the next verse and talk about how we ought to lay down our lives. I've told you this story before. I was growing up, the Pearl Gospel Singers, Pastor Cedric Reed's older brothers uh, that came here from Mississippi, Pastor Cedric Reed, and he had some older brothers, Steve and, and, um, and Perry. He had some older brothers. And they were singing in what is known as the Pearl Gospel Singers. One of their songs that really tore up the church. I mean, folks shouting all over the place. And as a young boy, I'm sitting there looking, ah. <laughs> the song goes like this. I want to be just like Jesus every day. That sounds good. I want to be more like Jesus every day. Next verse. I want to be more like him in every way. Good so far. He says, I want to walk like him. I want to live like him. And then they said, I want to die like him. I said, wait a minute. Now. <laughs> Even as a little boy, I'm saying something wrong with this picture. And the same guy that was singing it wasn't perfect. I want to be more like, I mean, and the song had a good beat. And people would shout all over the place and they would just throw their hats in Mississippi. They throw their hat. I mean, the preacher and the singers are in trouble in Mississippi. They'll throw their hats at you. They'll throw your, their, their, their fan at you. And let me tell you, when a fan is coming sideways and he can catch you in the neck right there, my grandmother used to always attack the preacher. Took a preacher here from here, a preacher, L.D. Lee, went to Mississippi. And he's a hooper and a singer. I mean, it got sure enough good to Lula Bell Wallace. It got good to her. She said, you better hush. And we all, all the grandchildren sitting there waiting to see what's going to happen. I mean, he was, he was laying it out. He was hooping. He was singing. And she said, you better hush. And we just sitting there waiting. I'm sitting in the pulpit. I just introduced him, and he just laying it out. I said to myself, I'm going to see how this plays out. <laughs> she said, I told you, you better hush. Go on now. And after a while, she jumped up and ran to the pulpit, and she wrapped her arms around him and just started squeezing the poor boy, just uh, taking him toward the floor. I said, I'm going to see how this is going to play out. <laughs> In Mississippi, when they get, high, they get happy, they, they, they get violent. Another incident, preacher standing up preaching, you better hush, and all of a sudden, here comes a fan. 
catches them, he's sore for three weeks. We have to understand that God is real. And it excites us. We ought to be excited about what God has to say. The thing that's always amazed us, amazed me rather, the thing that's always amazed me, the same people that would shout off a song would not shout off good preaching. As if the words of the song was more important than the words of the Bible. Matter of fact, they knew when to shout because they sung the same song every first Sunday and every third Sunday. I mean, they knew when he was getting to that point. They knew when she was going to lay it out really well. But when the preacher's preaching, they can sit there just as cool, calm, and collected. That tells me that it's not because you're an introvert that you don't celebrate. It tells me you made a choice. And the choice you made is to go with the emotions rather than with the word. And, and, and a great percentage of the songs that are sung are not spiritual songs. And then if they are spiritual, they're not biblical because everything has some kind of spirit. Well, he says, for this, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Then verse 17, he explains more. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shed up his heart from him, who does the love of God abide in? Or does it abide in him? He says, he says, no, I'm not asking you to die like Jesus. I'm not asking you to become the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus has already become the ultimate sacrifice. And because Jesus has become the ultimate sacrifice, we don't need to become a dead sacrifice. Jesus did that. We have to become, as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, we are a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is only our reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renew renewing of your mind. He says, says, look at what he says. He says to us today, he says to us then, he says, but whosoever has the worldly goods, the world's goods, whosoever, this word world's goods is the cosmos. It is the 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 adornment of things. It is this world system. He's saying, just as a man works and accumulates goods, he ought to share it with other people. He says, if you shut up your heart to him and you know he have need, he says, he has need, not greed. He's saying several things here. He's saying, if you, if a, if a feather brother have a need, and you shut up your heart to him, and you do not address the need, then you ought to question who you are in the Lord. So he says several things. Number one, he says, when a feather brother has a need, this word need is a necessity. This word need is a have to have in order to continue to live. This word need is not greed, it's need. Are you with me? 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. He says to us, but whoever has the world's goods. In other words, if you got things and you find a brother who has a need. You ought not shut up your heart. You ought to share it with him. Because if you shut up your heart, he asks the question, are you really a part of God? He says to us tonight, we need to understand beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we have this world's goods, we ought to share these goods with other people who are in need. First of all, he says need, not greed. So this word need means necessity because we know that people watch us very closely we know that people will buy what they want and beg for what they need are you with me 
People have a way of buying stuff and begging for what they need. And guess why they do that? They do it because you're not going to turn them down when they got to buy their medication. But they've spent money on other stuff that they should have spent on their medication. They know that you're not going to turn them down when they have to pay a house note and they got these little purity babies and these babies okay. can't be out on the street. You've heard the song and dance, right? Yeah. When they have a need, they beg for it. But when they have a want, they pay for it. What have I just said? When they have a need, they beg for it. When they have a want, they pay for it. Okay, what did I just say mean then? What, what, what do I mean when I make that statement? When, when people, when a people have, when people have needs, they beg for it. But when they have wants, they pay for it. So what did I just say? Okay, we, we got to the point where we got to have air conditioning. I mean, some of y'all couldn't have made it back home. Y'all, I mean, you couldn't have made it. I mean, you would have just given up on life if you had grown up the way I did. Some of us couldn't make it in church the way I made it in church. They, they raised the window with no with no no screen That's it. and just let the air blow from one side to the other. Can't make it in California. <laughs> Are you with me? So what am I saying? They they beg for what they need, but they buy what they want. What am I saying? Am I making sense? For yeah. Who's going to answer the question here? Anybody? Anybody? They have it's a matter of priority, right? It's a matter of priority. I just can't go buy a Lamborghini. Y'all gonna give me a pay increase? Huh? Come on. Don't you feel guilty that I just can't go buy what I want? You don't? I understand. And I know I just can't go jump out there and buy something. I have to make plans. I have to save. I have to sacrifice. So he says that when you have a brother in need, don't turn him away. Don't shut up your heart to him. Help him out. Help a brother out. Are you with me? So he's, he's not talking about the greedy. And he's not talking those, about those who have misplaced priorities. He's simply talking to us tonight about a brother that's struggling. Don't get the scripture turned, turned on the wrong side when it says, if a brother does not work, he shall not eat. What is he saying? It's the attitude toward working. He's come to a point in his life, I ain't working. I asked the contractor. I said, hey, where, where's the project manager you used to have? He said, man, he, he didn't want to work. He didn't want to work. Are you with me? So we have to understand, if we don't work, we ought not eat. But he's not saying if a brother get, is down on his luck. It's not saying that if a brother loses his job. It's not saying if a brother or sister just come up to some hard times. It's saying if you got an attitude that I'm not going to work. I had to tell a brother one time, I said, brother, you have a dream. And you say this dream has been given to you from God. You say that God has called you to full-time ministry. But the problem I'm having, I'm checking into this stinking chemical plant every day, and when I get home, you got your hand out. I mean, my total 20-year friendship was gone. In other words, if God has called you to ministry, to minister full-time, if it's God's will, it's God's bill, not my bill. He was making it my bill. Hey, man, can you help me with this? Hey, man, I got this. I, I need this. The problem is I'm working and you're not. I mean, that was a riff right down the middle. It's been 20 years ago. But he says if a brother just in between jobs, if he's struggling, help him out. Don't, don't turn your back on him. He's talking about abiding in God. How does love, the, the love of God abides in him if he shuts down? Let's look at the next verse, verse number 18. 
He says, my little children. We talked about my little children. He's talking about those who are young in the faith, right? He says, my little children, let us not love in word. My little children, let us not love in tongue, but let us love in deed and in truth. Are you with me? He says, don't love in word. Don't just love and talk about how you love people. He says, you have to have a genuine love for people. A genuine love. It has to not be love by speaking it in word. It can't be love just by speaking it in tongue. He said, let your deeds show you how much you love. Sister Davis, I just love you so much. Sister Davis, I love you. Sister Davis, I love you. Sister Davis, I love you. As why is she going to be saying, oh, you do? Right. You really do? Well, you have to show me indeed. Yes. 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 Show me by your efforts. That's why, the, that's why the men of old, they weren't very affectionate men, but they worked hard and they paid the bills and they brought the check home. That was a demonstration for love. That was a demonstration of love. That was a demonstration in love. A woman asked me one night in Bible study. She says, well, Pastor Davis, what's wrong with me taking my tithes and offering to Louisiana, giving to my home church back there? What would you have said? I mean, I'm in front of a crowd of people, and she asked me this question. And how would you have answered that? Is there, first of all, is there a problem? And her statement was, I'm still, in, still giving to God. Okay, sister, you said that's a problem. Talk to me. Yeah, it's you. It's always the person that says me. Yeah. <laughs> is there a problem? Yes. Why is that a problem? Because you actually use it to grow practical terms. You, you pay for your needs. Yeah, I like that. And you pay for your needs. Amen. If she's if you're feeding her, she's growing spiritually. She needs to pay where she's eating. Okay, she's saying you pay where you eat. In other words, you don't go to one restaurant and eat and go next door to a different restaurant and pay for it. Or go to Louisiana to a different restaurant and pay for it. That's true. And so after church, I give you right hand welcome and fellowship to the new beginning church. <laughs> <laughs> we have to understand there's a problem with that. And you're right, you pay where you eat. Her question to me was, what's wrong with me taking my tithes and offering to Louisiana, giving it to the church in Louisiana where I grew up? My question, I had to use myself. I should have used her as an example, but I used myself because I have to be pastoral, right? I said the same thing that would be wrong if I took my paycheck and gave it to the woman across the street and Sister David didn't get in. Will that work, Sister David? Are you sure? Are you very sure? So, you, you give where you eat. You appreciate where you are. Even if you're getting ready to be in between churches, you give as long as you're there. And then, until you find another place, you continue to give there. Are you with me? We're on the same page? And so we have to understand that the Bible is telling us that we can't give just in word. We can't love just in tongue. You got to love indeed. And he's not saying love indeed. He's saying love with your deeds. Love by showing your deeds. I'm telling you, we wouldn't have made it very long if every day I showed up, I just said, Sister Davis, I just love you so much, girl. I just love you. I just love you. I just love you. Wouldn't have made it. Wouldn't have made it at all. I mean, wouldn't have made it two days. It's love has to be shown. 
And that's how it is in the Christian walk. We have to show love to our brothers and sisters. John says to us tonight that you got to love in deed and in truth. This word truth means you must love in Jesus Christ. You must love in God. It must be a demonstration to God through godliness. In other words, it ought to be authentic. You can't fake it in this business. You just can't fake it. You just can't do it. You, you could think you're getting by. You think you're fooling everybody. You're not fooling anybody but yourself. When you don't show love, genuine love, people know it. They just don't tell you. They, they let you fool yourself. And when they leave, they say, hey, I'm not going back to that church anymore. They faking it over there. And guess what? It doesn't have to be but one person faking. And the whole church get labeled. I was a brand new pastor within the first six months. Brand new pastor. And you know, I have this, this habit of just greeting and hugging people, especially before COVID. We're just, I'm just greeting and hugging. Pray. I'm, I'm a brand new pastor, never pastored before. I'm in my first six months. We have family and friends day. And, and this woman comes up to me the next Sunday and says, I'm mad with you. You know, folk, on, they don't mind telling preachers they mad with them. They're not going to tell their boss, but they, they tell preachers in a heartbeat. It, some people think that it's their responsibility and they, their whole purpose of being on earth was to t keep the preacher straight. So she comes to me and she says, I'm mad with you. Okay, let me have it. She says, my son and his wife came to church and you didn't even hug them. I said, honey, there was more than 80 people here. There were several visitors here. I'm only one person. I'm standing right where everybody's passing. I hugged everybody who came toward me. But she's mad at me because I didn't hug her son and her daughter-in-law. My, my, my. Another woman left the church because I forgot to call her child's name in prayer. The only way I do is I'm done with you. Good God Almighty. So we have to understand that, that love, love is of God. And it has to be genuine. It has to be in the truth. You can't fake it. I see people time after time again faking it. I can't just, if I ran around and said that you faking it, I'd be saying you faking it every day. Possibly all day. People just faking it. They're just faking it. And the problem is they don't realize that God really sees them. God is really watching you. And God is putting you to the test on how you handle this situation. How many people going through a tough time right now? Anybody? Just a tough time. Got two. Got two. Got two that are admitted anyway. Oh, got, got three. So, if you're going through a tough time right now, what God is doing, he's seeing how you're going to handle it. And not only is God seeing how you're going to handle it, the people are seeing how you're going to handle it. Amen. Michelle Obama says, the president doesn't change who you are. The president re presidency doesn't change who you are. The presidency reveals who you are. And we just saw that for four years. We saw that. Right? And she also says, when they go low to cut your legs off, you go high. God is watching. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. God sees it. And he even sees your heart. He sees your heart. He, he knows what you're thinking before you're thinking. He sees it all. We admit that God is omniscient, meaning that he knows everything. He, he is omnivisual, a word that I made up. He's omnivisual. He sees everything. We admit that. But then we'll go do something we think we're hiding them from God. He says your deeds must be done in truth and you must love by way of your deeds. Final verse, verse 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth. We are of God. By this we know we're walking in godliness and shall assure, shall assure our hearts before him. 
It says we know we are of God because it's authentic love. You can't fake this love. You may, you know, the, the thing about it, and sometimes I think it's a bad thing about it, is that we can wear masks and nobody sees us. We, we went home one time and, and we drove up in Indianola, Mississippi, and and we wrote down through down we we wrote through downtown, picked mama up and came back through downtown, and police were everywhere. Two young men, brothers, had gone in, allegedly gone into a jewelry store, shot a woman in the head. Of course, they had masks on, right? From that point on, all the jewelry stores declared you cannot come in our jewelry store with masks on ever again. We'd rather have COVID than have you jokers with masks on. <laughs> Are you with me? We would much rather take a chance on COVID than you walk in with a mask on and our cameras can't view who you are. We try to fake it as if we got a full face mask on sometimes. And even with our mask on, God sees us. God sees us. God is watching us. We ought to operate in truth. And then he, he talks about the fact, and in this we know that we are in God, in truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. This phrase, assure our hearts before him, this is referring to the coming back of Jesus Christ. He refers to the fact that one of these days, Jesus is going to crack the sky. He's coming to get a church without a spot on a wrinkle. Where are your wrinkles? Get them out now. Are you wrinkled? Let me tell you, I, I'm the first to confess. I got some wrinkles. I, got, I have some spots. And I need the Lord to work on me. I need the Lord to fix me. I need the Lord to break me. I need the Lord to bend me. Back home, the old folk would say it like this: that you can you can bend a you can bend a young tree, but once that tree gets full grown, it, you guys have to break it. <laughs> you either break it or leave it alone. They say you can manipulate soft concrete, but once concrete gets hard, you can't manipulate it. Guess what? You just have to break it and chisel it up. I don't want God to break me. I want God to do like David said, restore me a right heart. Give me a clean spirit. <clears throat> Uphold me with your free spirit. Mold me, Lord. And see, the thing about it is, most of the times, we don't have to hide it from people. We can just go to God on our own. People don't even have to know it. That's a good thing. We have a God who sees, hears everything. He's every place. And if we struggle with something, you go to God and say, God, this is what I'm struggling with. Don't go to God and say, God, here I am again. You know. No, you go to God and you call that thing out. That's right. You go to God and say, God, this is what I'm, Lord. And then people like to say, I just told a little white lie. It's a lie. <laughs> you know, everything white ain't cute. <laughs> everything white ain't cute they, they painted a picture to make, make us think that everything that's white is cute everything white ain't cute and every lie that's a little white lie ain't little because guess what whatever the lie is it's damaging to people and it's, it is disobedience unto God questions or comments questions or comments Anybody, anywhere. First John chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. I say to you, read over it and read the rest of First John chapter 3. Prepare for next week so we can have a good time in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Any questions or comments? Any corrections on the teaching? Uh, Brother Whitlock raising his hand. <laughs> Any, any corrections, any questions, any, anybody else? For those of you who are listening, we, we submit Jesus Christ to you. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
you can do so tonight by trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the same Jesus that we talk about coming back to rescue the church, he died on Calvary. He was buried in a barber tomb, and he rose from the dead. This is your opportunity to get to know him. Just bow your head with me and invite him in even on tonight. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer, honestly believing the story that Jesus died for your sins, and rose from the dead, we believe that you're born again. And when you die, whenever that may be, you're on your way to heaven. There may be others who are in between church homes or others who don't have a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church. Of course, here, Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. But Jesus is the captain of the ship. Inbox us and let us know that you want to be a part of this great church in Southeast Houston. And we'll be glad to welcome you. And if you receive Christ tonight during the broadcast, please, ma'am, please, sir, let us know so we can rejoice with you and that you can be a part of this family of faith that we can celebrate with you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Why don't we thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you need an envelope, raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail your gifts in to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Again, thank you so much for being a part of our service. Thank you for joining us. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.